This is BBC One Southwest. And now the news presented by John Sopel with Jenny Walrond. A tough new message tonight from the police chief fighting underage drinking. Cheshire's top officer says parents who won't accept help for their children's drunken antisocial behaviour should be punished. Well, sanction really, ultimately, um, you know, if, if you're not willing to take up that offer, clearly is that your child would have to be considered as part of care proceedings. We'll be assessing Lee's latest comments and his view on how the public should tackle criminal behaviour. Also tonight, 11 million more householders will now have to provide home information packs if they're think? selling up. Echoes of the Cold War as the Russian president orders long-range bombers back into the skies. And a giant of Fleet up, Street no. dies. Lord Deeds, the former Daily Telegraph editor, has passed away at the age of 94. In the southwest, householders are warned not to approach yobs, even if they're vandalising property. And why a million pounds in funding for affordable housing could be lost. Good evening. Earlier this week, he called for drinking to be made illegal in public places and for tighter restrictions on the sale of alcohol. Tonight, Cheshire's Chief Constable Peter Fahey has gone further and said parents who won't accept help for their children's drunken antisocial behaviour should be punished. He was speaking out again less than a week after a father of three from Warrington was killed after being attacked outside his home. The Chief Constable also spoke about how the public should stand up to yobs. From Warrington, Mark Simpson reports. Preparing for drunkenness and possible violence. It's the night shift in Warrington, but it could be many other towns in Britain this evening. Just remember tonight, same as usual, visibility, intelligence is led, get forms in, stop check forms. The problem of teenage drinking is a big part of the job for these officers. Their chief constable says that if parents cannot control their kids and refuse offers of help, action must be taken. If you're not willing to take up that offer, clearly is that you, your child would have to be considered as part of care proceedings. It's always difficult in such circumstances to talk about finding parents. I mean, I think that's something which would need greater consideration. It's exactly a week since Gary Newlove was fatally injured only yards from his front door in Warrington. His death raised the whole issue of what the public should or shouldn't do about confronting young people who may be involved in neighbourhood violence. So what's the advice from the Chief Constable? What should I do? I'm looking out of my bedroom window later on, I see someone attacking my car. What should I do? As a Chief Constable, I've got to you know, say the official advice is not to get involved because of the threats out there, but you know, using common sense, people will want to protect their own property and we've got to aspire for a society where the law-abiding are able to challenge the behaviour of those who are up to no good. Back on the streets, extra officers are on patrol. They're not just looking for lawbreakers, but trying to give reassurance. The more people that are interested in actually helping and doing something to put that, you know, back to And the young people say they need all the help they can get. To have a good time on a Friday night, people drink, but it's like, it doesn't always, like, a fight doesn't always happen because people drink. There's people like us who just sit here and have a laugh and then we walk down the street to the shop or something and because we're in a big group, People think that we're going to do something. You just assume we're doing something bad. And we're not. We're just having a laugh. It's been quiet so far tonight, and these officers desperately hope it stays that way. The problem is, the weekend has only just begun. Mark Simpson, BBC News, Warrington. Well, as we heard there from the Chief Constable, this week's events have also focused attention on what people should do when confronted by groups of rowdy and often drunken youths. The government has said tonight it wants the public to take a stand, to complain to the police and help gather evidence, but not put themselves in any danger or take the law into their own hands. Here's our Home Affairs correspondent, Daniel Sanford. What happens when you decide to take on the yobs yourself? Well, Neil Taylor, who lives on the outskirts of Preston, found out last year. One of the youths I wasn't aware of came running up from behind me and uh, launched a vicious assault in my face with his foot. And the actual phone box there, as you can see, 
is where he'd hidden um, a local iron, uh, about three foot iron bar. He proceeded to pull that down and beat me about the head. His injuries left him needing 10 hours of reconstructive surgery. The men had beaten him because he dared to ask why one of them had assaulted his daughter. The ambulance arrived and advised me to go to hospital. But While we were interviewing him, three youths walked past and he thought and he recognised one of them. Yeah. Uh, that's one of the youths who assaulted me walking past oh, yeah. now in the background. Yeah. Neil survived, but Richard Whelan didn't. His mistake was to challenge a man on a London bus who was throwing chips at his girlfriend. When Richard Whelan was killed here on the 43 bus, there were plenty of other passengers, but detectives had very few witnesses. Not only was he the only one who dared to intervene, very few people dared to help police afterwards. In the last few years, the death toll of people trying to stop antisocial behaviour has been high. A week ago, it was Gary Newlove protecting his property. Last August, Peter Woodhams shot dead in East London after confronting youths terrorising his family. Two years ago, Alan Fessy killed in Warwickshire trying to help his relatives. Ian Hen lives just around the corner from where Alan Fessy was killed. When his van kept being broken into by yobs, he called the police, but they didn't help until one day he got desperate. I found the police up and said, well, tonight I'm going to wait in my van with my sat-nav sat on, uh, on the window screen, wait for someone to come in, I'll throw petrol over him because uh, nothing's being done and I'm on the verge of losing my job. But since I made the threat and there's police circling the area, I got out of my van, he saw my van and said, Ian, yeah, can, can we see you? Yeah, no problem. I bought you a garage alarm. Tonight, the government told the BBC it wants people to take a stand against jobs, but not to take the law into their own hands or put themselves at risk. It wants people to help the police by reporting crime and gathering evidence. But as we discovered, people do tell the police, but they can't or don't always attend. No one wants job rule, so people take action themselves, and then some of them get hurt or worse. Daniel Sandford, BBC News. Shares have been rising sharply on both sides of the Atlantic after the turmoil yesterday on the world's financial markets. America's Dow Jones Index has just closed in New York. Our correspondent, Darshini David, is there. So, Darshini, what's made the difference today? Well, John, if you were watching the markets today, you might be thinking, turmoil, what turmoil? In London, we saw the FTSE finishing up 3.5%. It's actually recovering a lot of those billions of pounds that it lost yesterday. Here in the US, leading shares were up by close to 2%. The markets got an early boost when the American Central Bank cut the interest rate at which it lends to cash-strapped banks who've been affected by uh, homeowners defaulting on mortgages here. So that reassured many people that central banks really do have their eyes on the ball. I should stress this isn't the main interest rate which affects consumers, but the central banks have been quick to express caution about the economy, so many are betting that cost of borrowing will come down pretty soon. Having said that, great uncertainty still about how the wider global economy could be affected. The message from Wall Street is keep your eyes on your investments. That turmoil could continue. OK, Darshini in New York. Many thanks for that. Now, millions more people will have to buy home information packs if they want to sell their homes. From September, the controversial scheme is being extended to cover three-bedroom properties in England and Wales. The packs cost around £500. Critics have called them pointless red tape and an extra tax on homeowners. Here's Richard Scott. If you're moving home, this man could be knocking on your door. He'll investigate your property and take notes on how well you're doing, because he is a hip inspector. The HIPS revolution is aimed at speeding up the housing market. For just over a fortnight, anyone who's put a home with at least four bedrooms up for sale has needed a pack. But from the 10th of September, three-bedroom homes will need a HIP too. That'll mean 60% of the property market will be covered. It's been a chequered history though. Ten years in the making, HIPS were postponed at the last minute and had the compulsory property survey scrapped. Critics say the housing market is already being affected. The introduction for four bedroom and more properties has already had quite a big impact on, on the market. There's not enough people bringing their, uh, putting their properties on the market or even having valuations for that matter. And uh, the supply is drying up. 
Now, one of the main components of home information packs is the energy performance certificate. And you can see on this mocked up version that it looks just like the certificates you get when you buy a new fridge or a freezer. It gives your home a rating based on how green it is. Now that would include whether there are things like energy efficient light bulbs, whether the walls have got cavity insulation, and whether the windows are double glazed. The energy certificate has been welcomed by green groups which say it'll help combat climate change. We joined energy inspector Mike Walker as he went round a home in Epsom in Surrey. After spending thousands on training, he's now hoping for more work. Since the 1st of June I've had the, just had the one job, uh, so there's not been an awful lot of work around. So I'm very pleased to hear that three beds are coming in um, and that there's no delay, any further delay really. So that's, it, it's, it's, it's very positive news. The pack also includes local searches, which used to be paid for by the buyer. The government says that should help cut the millions of pounds wasted by consumers when home sales fall through. Sean Brill is thinking of selling his three-bedroom home in Cardiff and isn't happy about the extra cost. No, I just think it's another tax to be honest with you. I think they're grasping the straws. I think what they should be doing and could be doing is revamping the whole sort of sale market thing itself rather than add, just adding another tax. Eventually, the packs will be extended to the remaining 40% of the market, but there's no timescale for when that will happen. Richard Scott, BBC News, Epsom. Peru's president has appealed for calm after more tremors struck the region where an earthquake killed more than 500 people yesterday. Aftershocks measuring more than five on the Richter scale hit the southern port city of Pisco, creating widespread panic amongst the survivors. Rescuers are still searching a church which collapsed in yesterday's quake, burying hundreds of worshippers. Now, this week, Russia's president was photographed dressed in camouflage gear and stripped to the waist on a fishing trip. Today, Vladimir Putin has been flexing his muscles once again, but this time announcing that Russian bombers have taken to the skies again on long-range patrols reminiscent of the Cold War era. He was speaking as Russian and Chinese forces held joint military exercises in the Urals. From Moscow's Rupert Wingfield Hayes reports. In the Ural Mountains today, Russian and Chinese troops were fighting side by side to recapture a town held by rebel forces. It was, of course, all a game, a joint exercise watched by Presidents Putin and Hu Jintao. But away from the TV cameras, another, much more secret military operation was underway. Today, Starting today, 14 strategic missile bombers and refueling aircraft took off from seven air bases across Russia. This marks the start of air combat alert duties. From this day, this sort of mission will be carried out regularly. During the Cold War, this was a common sight for RAF pilots patrolling over the North Sea. But in 1992, unable to afford the fuel to fly them, the bombers were grounded. After 15 years, they're being sent back into the skies, this time on a political mission. Mr. Putin's delivering a message for Russian people that uh, times of humiliation is over. Now it times to, uh, to uh, return back to Russian interests, to defend Russian interests strongly. President Putin's whole image is of a Russian strongman. Earlier this week, he was bearing his chest for the cameras on a fishing trip to Siberia. It's an image that has made him immensely popular. One can't help feeling that President Putin's latest announcement contains a large dose of political theatre. When he leaves the Kremlin in a few months' time, Mr Putin wants to be remembered as the president who made Russia strong again. Whether it's true or not is another question. Rupert Wingfield Hayes, BBC News in Moscow. And coming up on tonight's programme, on the trail of the Hezbollah militants as they prepare for a new confrontation with Israel in secret. We're now on our way out of the village after those two men, clearly from Hezbollah, stopped us from filming. It's clear that there's something they want to hide in this area. 
Tax is back on the Tory agenda tonight after a Conservative policy group reported back today and recommended scrapping inheritance tax and reducing stamp duty. The Shadow Chancellor, George Osborne, said he would carefully consider the proposals, but the government said the plans represented a lurch to the right. Laura Kunzberg reports. David Cameron shifted the Conservative compass. Climate change a concern, global poverty on the agenda, alongside what he calls the broken society at home. But today, more familiar ground. Former Minister John Redwood with the Shadow Chancellor talking about tax, but do they actually agree? We first of all believe that a lower tax rate economy would be a more successful economy. The best way to tax the rich is to cut rates and reform capital taxes. At the last two general elections, we offered tax reductions, an overall reduction in tax. Uh, we are not going to be offering an overall reduction in tax at this general election. Most eye-catching, perhaps, is the proposal to scrap death duties. As property prices have risen, more people have become liable to pay. So it's an unpopular tax and getting rid of it could win votes. But in fact, only about one in 20 people are liable to cough up. So is the prospect of cutting the tax designed more to soothe the Conservative right wing? The party leadership have welcomed the proposals. But listen very carefully. Mr Redwood is optimistic, but there's no sign of the Shadow Chancellor actually signing up. Well, abolishing inheritance tax and reforming and reducing capital gains tax, the two go together as a package, is very crucial because all the studies show from around the world that those who abolish and cut capital taxes find that things grow most quickly. I'm looking very carefully at whether we can reform inheritance tax to ease the burden uh, on these people, but I'm not going to make any commitments here and now, and I'm not going to do anything that endangers economic stability or, or the soundness of the public finances. So with shaky financial markets around the world, the party's leadership is sticking to the script, but Labour is still quick to accuse them of moving to the right. This is exactly the same agenda that they had in the past, the right-wing agenda that William Hague, Michael Howard followed. They were also proposing deregulating the sale of mortgages, for example, getting rid of data protection. This is a long way from the centre ground of British politics. The Lib Dems say David Cameron is not in control, and after months ahead in the polls, the Conservatives have fallen back. It's not the first time David Cameron's Conservatives have talked about tax. A report last year made similar suggestions, but the leadership was distinctly lukewarm about this. And while there aren't any firm promises on today's proposals, the response was much more enthusiastic. It may not be enough for everyone in the party, but has soothed some Conservative nerves. Laura Kunzberg, BBC News, Westminster. Police in Skegness say they're treating a fire which badly damaged parts of the resort as suspicious. At its height, around 200 firefighters tackled the blaze and the flames could be seen from 20 miles away. Bars, clubs, restaurants and arcades were destroyed, but no one was hurt. The operators of a plastics factory in Glasgow, where nine people died in a gas explosion, have pleaded guilty to breaching health and safety regulations. They admitted failing to ensure the safety of their workers. Forty people were injured in the blast three years ago. The operators will be fined at a later hearing. There are growing fears that Lebanon's militant group Hezbollah is preparing for a new war with Israel. This week, its supporters have been marking the one-year anniversary since the end of last summer's conflict, boasting we're stronger than ever. More than 1,000 Lebanese and at least 150 Israelis were killed during the fighting, which ended with a UN-brokered ceasefire. But as Andrew North found out in southern Lebanon, Hezbollah appears to be rearming. The party of God. Hezbollah celebrates this week in its southern Beirut stronghold. A slickly organised rally that was more like a rock concert. But the star attraction, its leader Hassan Nasrallah, forced to speak via TV link as he's a constant Israeli target. <laughs> His message defiant, threatening a heavy price for Israel if there's another war. But this is their public face. What Hezbollah is really up to now, it wants to keep hidden. We drove to their heartlands in the mountains of southern Lebanon. First to a village where the government accuses Hezbollah of building a secret communications network. The local mayor said he knew nothing about it. 
but fears his area will now be on an Israeli hit list. But as we talk, others are watching, and all eyes here report to Hezbollah. Just minutes after we left, Hezbollah men who'd been alerted to our presence blocked our way. We kept our camera running. So they're saying we can do no more filming at all. We can't talk to anybody. What's the reason? No reason, he said. We're now on our way out of the village after those two men, clearly from Hezbollah, stopped us from filming. It's clear that there's something they want to hide in this area. This is Hezbollah country. Memorials to dead fighters line the roads. And just a few miles further on, the men from Hezbollah appeared again. But this time, they took the tape from our camera and told us to leave. They said we were in their military zone. Here in southern Lebanon, Hezbollah is preparing for another war. But they've always been masters at concealing their activities. It's significant, though, that both places where we were stopped from filming were near here. Because what it appears Hezbollah is doing is building new defences just north of this river, the Litani. Just outside the area to the south, patrolled by the Lebanese army and UN peacekeepers. And even where the extra UN peacekeepers are patrolling, Hezbollah hasn't gone away. Back in Beirut, I met one of their senior officials, who boasted they're stronger than ever despite the restrictions. We have rebuilt our fighting lines after the United Nations and the Lebanese army arrived. We have missiles now which can cover all the Palestinian lands. We found it's been rebuilding its propaganda machine too. This is a video game of its battles with Israeli troops on show at a new Hezbollah exhibition in Beirut. With its hallmark Katusha rockets, Hezbollah always seems to win. In another hall, a grisly audio-visual display of Israeli forces under attack, complete with a destroyed tank. The Israelis are made to look weak and defeated. Hezbollah invincible, determined to keep fighting. Andrew North, BBC News, Beirut. Lord Deeds, the former Daily Telegraph editor, has died. The inspiration for evil in wars, Henry Boot character in Scoop, a government minister briefly and a landmines campaigner with Princess Diana, he was one of the great characters of Fleet Street. One of his first reporting assignments was the Spanish Civil War, and he carried on churning out his copy right up until the very end. Tonight, the Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, said Britain owed him a huge debt of gratitude. Nick Hyam looks back at a remarkable life. Abyssinia, 1935, and Bill Deeds is there as a war correspondent and freelance newsreel cameraman. There, he met the novelist Evelyn Waugh. Deeds became the naive young William Boot in Waugh's novels, Scoop. It's news, he said. Get in a photograph of Boot. Give it two columns depth. This is the first front page foreign news we've had for a month. Bill Deeds himself wasn't naive. In the slums of depression hit Britain, he'd learnt his trade as a reporter, as well as his brand of compassionate conservatism. Frankly, they say, we're always very frank, frankly, they say... Later, he became an MP, and for two years he was a member of the Cabinet, his dry wit deployed in the service of government propaganda. Then he returned to journalism as editor of the Daily Telegraph. That's better. No. No, in private good. eyes, satirical Dear Bill letters, right. Deeds's real-life golfing partner of 40 years, Dennis Thatcher, described the world as seen from Margaret Thatcher's number 10. Private Eye also poked gentle fun at Bill Deeds' distinctive speech. Ah, yes, well, I have a bit, a bit of a slur there. Yes, that's right, some mistake, I mean. Yes, I, I, there was a bit of that there, you see. It, if any policeman ever stops him in a car, he, th he takes the breathalyzer out almost instantly because he thinks it must be a sign of excess. No longer an editor, he became a full-time columnist and feature writer for The Telegraph well into his 90s. He struck up an unlikely friendship with Diana, Princess of Wales. They campaigned together against landmines. And he travelled the world reporting wars and disasters. A shrewd and sympathetic observer who never lost his true reporter's enthusiasm for the story. 
If you can guess right, or guess partly right, what's going to happen tomorrow, where the story is going to be, enormous satisfaction. Lord Deeds, Bill Deeds, who died today aged 94. Now, the 10 o'clock news hour continues on BBC News 24 with tomorrow's papers, a business roundup, and in Sports Day at 10.30, why the Australian cricket legend Shane Warne wants to become German. And on BBC One, I'll be back with the headlines after we've joined our news teams where you are. Bye for now.